G'day there guys, Vanquisher of Karens, Mark is here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parents. Now if you love these stories like I love reading them, I want you to smash that like button and tell me what you think of it down in the comments below. Enjoy your stay and I'll see you soon. Posted by user Anchor McDaddy, titled, Karen attempts to order at a closed restaurant, despite me telling her that she can't order because we're closed. This happened about four years ago when I was working at McDonald's. Now, this one is a 24-7 McDonald's, but due to the management at the time, we had to do a deep clean. So we closed at 8, and we gave considerable notice, as there were signs everywhere letting people know. Then there's the blind driver who went past all seven signs, not noticing a single one. I'm on the headset for drive through Our car star, me, yours truly, E.M. Entitled Mother, and M. The Manager. Me. Here's the beep that someone's at the order station and I say, Hi, welcome to McDonald's. Unfortunately, we're closed at the moat. I'd like a fish finger happy meal and a large quarter pounder meal with a Diet Coke, please. I'm sorry, ma'am. We can't provide any services at the moment because we just closed for maintenance and deep cleaning tonight. What do you mean? This is an all-day, all-night McDonald's. Yes, we are. However, this was the business manager's decision, ma'am. I can't provide any service at this time. I'm posted here to let customers know that we're closed in case they miss the signs outside. I don't like your tone. I'd like to see your manager. Of course, ma'am. One minute, please. So I go to the manager and explain the situation up to when she asked for him. He takes the headset and I grab a spare. Manager says, Hello, this is the manager for tonight. What seems to be the issue? I'd like to order, please. Ma'am, my crew member explained we are closed at the moment for maintenance and deep cleaning. You're going to have to find another McDonald's that's open, like the one in X and the other one in the city center. But it's my son's birthday today, and I want to treat him. Ma'am, I understand that, but none of our equipment is on to provide service. Ugh, you ruined my kid's birthday. I'm coming to the window. Entitled Mother drives up to the window and demands to see my manager's superior, screaming at him, not knowing that he is the only superior there, since he's the damned business manager. And he says, I am the business manager, ma'am. You've decided to harass my crew and disrespect me. We have your plate, face, and car's description, and will not only report you to the police, but we're permanently banning you from this McDonald's. Congrats, though. You're the first person I've ever had to ban. Karen drives off, and we resume the cleaning. We did have leftovers from before we closed, so we held a friendly competition for the most creative burger. I didn't win, but I got to eat my spicy quad Big Mac Supreme. TLDR, Karen didn't get the hint that we're closed, so she screams at the business manager to get his in-store superior when he has no superior in the store. She was banned and we reported her to the police for aggressive behaviour. Thank you for reading. Posted by user Pumpkin Thighs, titled, Could My Mom Be Religiously Abusive? This all pretty much started when I was 13. At the time, I had undiagnosed depression, and as a result of being sad, I shut myself in and hated going anywhere. I would flip out at a lot of people, and while it was an embarrassing part of my life, I don't think I can really blame myself. I mean, one day I'm just a happy teenager, and the next I'm hit with a wall of just self-loathing and sadness. You can credit it to regular teenage moodiness, but it doesn't just happen overnight. Anyways, when I first had some depressive episodes, I didn't want to go to church as a result. The first week or so I could fake sick, but I couldn't fake sick every Sunday. My parents ended up dragging me to church while I was in tears because I didn't feel well mentally, was confused as to why I didn't feel well mentally, and hated my parents and church as a result. I remember my mom saying things like, It's just a phase, you need to go to church. You don't get a choice in the matter. Very hypocritical considering the fact that my religion highlights the whole free agency thing. You're in big trouble if we catch you out of line. I ended up hiding in the bathroom or leaving the church building just to cry and avoid my family. My mum specifically would drag me to the temple when I knew for a fact that I had been sinning and wasn't worthy to attend the temple. Sexual sins, mainly. She brushed off my pleas to just stay home. 
If anything, I think that I kept those sins going because it was the one ounce of pleasure that I got. I didn't do it because, haha, dick look funny, I want the D, but because I lacked pleasure and enjoyment in life, so that physical pleasure became a solid source of enjoyment in life. It was a truly dark place. I'm not sure if this is how it works, but I think I either kicked the depression bucket away or learned to repress it and pretend everything was a-okay. My parents stopped saying those things because I was just sitting there quietly now, and I truly believed that I didn't get a choice or deserve a choice in my own religious path. It's pretty much been alright since then. There have been the occasional weekends when I just mentally feel horrible, only to get the whole, you don't get a choice crap. I'm 17 now, and have officially been diagnosed. My depression had gotten really bad again. I believe it's partially due to the fact that I'm being forced to attend church and attend a 6am church class every fudging weekday. I can't get enough sleep and I just want to have time to focus on myself and practice healthy habits. It's not faith if it's forced. Recently, my mum turned to giving me a choice. Either I attend church and the early morning class, or lose driving privileges and successfully be isolated at home because I can't go out to see friends or go to work without asking for a ride. My mum claims it's not manipulation because it's a choice, but I really don't think she's in the right. Is my mum actually religiously abusive, or am I just a tired, moody teenager? Update slash edit. I'm not sure which to use, but I just kind of wanted to address everyone else's kind words. I know Mormonism isn't a rather liked religion, but it's nice to see that people actually looked past the religion part and focused on my mom and her actions towards me. I learned that I don't hate my religion, but instead have an underlying hatred towards my mother. I've invited her to my next therapy session this coming Tuesday because I know that just telling her myself won't end well. Overall, I'm so happy for all the support. I plan on getting my mum to understand that I'm taking a break from church and church-related activities until after I graduate, because I can't handle going to church knowing that she's breathing down my neck. I'll update again after therapy. Posted by user Fallen Astray, titled, Biological Dad Blames Me for the Abuse I Suffered from His Girlfriend for Years. Alright, alright. I'm not sure where this should go, either under r slash raised by narcissists or r slash abusive parents or what, but I figured I would start here. Warning, this is rather long and I just needed to get this off my chest. Small backstory, my mom and dad divorced when I was in the fifth grade. I'm on the lower spectrum of autism and didn't understand anything that was really happening during this time. I'm 22 now and I understand everything, but growing up, all I knew was that my younger sister, three years younger than me, and I, would see our biological dad every weekend, to every other weekend, and sometimes on holidays. He got a new girlfriend, and my mum met my stepdad. Both sides had a child. My half-brother from my mum's side, and my half-sister on my dad's, both are less than a year apart. Okay, that wasn't really a small backstory, but whatever. About the end of middle school, my sister and I were seeing my biological dad every other weekend. I'll say it now, my dad when I was little and before the divorce was an incredible father. I was known as the daddy's girl, and I loved him to the ends of the world. He taught me how to make omelettes, allowed me to stir the mac and cheese, brought us to many places that I still love now. That was before he met his girlfriend. At first, she was okay. She knew how to bake really well and enjoyed watching cooking shows, and I'll say this now that she isn't thin. Um, she isn't even average. She was big. Like, big, big. And she was very religious. At first, being super naive at my ripe young age of 10, I didn't understand the little things that she would do. My hair was really long back then, about down to my hips. I hated how long it was, so I didn't care if it got knots, or tangled, or anything. I was just too quiet and nervous to have it cut, so it stayed long. In middle school, I was signed up to do dance classes in an attempt to help me make friends with kids my age. <laughs> Lol, didn't work out for me. And it was required to have your hair up in a bun. I just couldn't figure out how to tie it up. 
She would make comments about how I was a slow snail and got mad at me when I asked for help, saying it was ridiculous for someone my age not to know how to tie up my hair in a bun. I remember crying about this and for my dad to tell me to suck it up. Eventually, as I got older, I was developing in ways that I didn't like. In dance class, all the other kids were like twigs, and I was this curvier, thicker kid. Very quiet and shy, and no one wanted to be around me. I was still this incredible and passionate dancer, but the way I looked made me feel off about myself. On top of the comments from this girlfriend, it really hit my self-esteem. I was still unaware of the things this girlfriend would do, and how badly it affected my eating. My sister was way more aware of things she would do to me that I just couldn't see. I remember one evening while our dad was grabbing things from the store and his girlfriend was watching us. We were in this area that was halfway between the kitchen and the living room. There was a bag of chips on the counter that we would take a few pieces out of while chatting. My sister was showing different dance moves, the girlfriend was talking, and I was listening and eating the chips. I remember specifically that I did not finish the bag. There was still plenty left for two more full servings. She suddenly grabs the chip bag to put away and notices how empty, in her eyes, that it was. And she straight up loses it at me. I could only sit there in shock as she tells me I was going to grow up to be fat and a disgusting woman, talking about my period, God hates gluttons, and how crappy my self-control was if I couldn't stop myself from eating half a bag of chips. I ended up crying in the bathroom and didn't eat for the rest of the day. Now here's where the title of this post comes from. I'll say it now, I was rather a picky eater. I didn't like Mexican, Asian, pizza, hamburgers, various sandwiches, and etc. And many food items I had to have ketchup with, it was pretty bad. I'm getting better about it now, but it was a huge safety net for me to dip in ketchup when trying new food. But still, I was very, very picky. Both dad and his girlfriend knew that very well. I don't remember when this started, but she started to not care about how picky I was. I don't like warm and mushy fruits, so blueberry pancakes were a big no for me. Instead of making a separate, as my dad was about to do, she stopped him and told him to add blueberries to it anyways. Obviously, I didn't really like it, so I started carefully picking the blueberries out of the pancakes so that I could eat them. Before I could even start eating, she took my plate away and threw it in the trash, saying I wasn't allowed to eat for the rest of the day. I was too shocked to even cry. Just bottling it up and remaining quiet on the couch, we weren't allowed to take anything from the fridge, so I had to sit there and watch the rest of everyone eat without me. Luckily, while she was taking a shower, my dad manages to make a small bowl of those little baby pickles for me to munch on so that I had something in my stomach. This continued for years. They would make something that they knew I wouldn't like, and I tried my best to eat what I could. I would ask for ketchup, and she would yell at me about how disgusting I was for wanting that on her cooking. Every dinner, I would beg for it. Even if it was food I liked, but required that delicious tomato paste, they refused to give it to me. Eventually, I started eating really fast. The tastes and textures made me want to vomit, but I was sick of coming back to my mum's house and straight up devouring the whole fridge. His girlfriend again yells at me for eating too fast. Every single time, she would take my food away, and I wasn't allowed to eat anything for the rest of the day. My sister and I would have to sit there and watch them grab snacks and lunches for themselves, shoving food down their gullets while we had to find something to do, afraid of getting yelled at if we sat on the couch for too long while they would sit there all day on their phones. It came to a point where I was terrified to ask for a glass of water in their house. My sister and I would try and come up with excuses to not go there, to which my dad would then guilt trip us. He'd say, oh, well, I guess I'll have to tell your baby sister why her sisters aren't coming over. So we had to go. Not allowed to bring our games, not allowed to bring homework, had to sit and wait for food and hope it wasn't taken away. I was too afraid to say anything. And when I did say something, I was screamed at about how much of a pathetic idiot I was. Because of this, I was, and still am, the slowest eater in all of my friend groups. 
I would always ask for permission to do things such as use the bathroom, grab a cup of water, ask if I accidentally grabbed too much food, and if I should put it back, if it's okay to have seconds. This led to me starving myself of food because I didn't believe I deserved it. In dance, I had the worst self-esteem. Comparing my body to those very thin and teeny girls, I would weigh myself over a dozen times a day, harming myself so I could not feel the hunger pains, covering mirrors because I didn't want to see how gross my body was, and developing into something that I hated, and still get ridiculed and yelled at about my weight from this girlfriend. I was throwing up my meals and stayed in one spot, either on the couch or a hermit in my bedroom, drawing to try and pass the time, only to get yelled at for being a lazy bum. I think you all know where this is going. To spare the graphic detail, my mum had to rush me to the hospital. On the way there, my mum was chewing my dad a new a-hole through the phone, yelling at him about how much weight I've lost, how his girlfriend was not to treat me like that, a whole lot of things that I couldn't remember. My dad did come to see me. I thought maybe since he was alone and away from his girlfriend, he would apologize and just, you know, be a father. But instead, what he said absolutely broke me. Why on earth would you do this to yourself? You're 15. You should know better. I just don't understand why you would do something so stupid. I just started sobbing. I was in the hospital, and he just couldn't understand that he and his girlfriend led me to this place. I didn't know what to say to him. All I could do was stutter and rock back and forth to try and soothe myself but he just kept asking those same questions. He left as my mum enters. All I could do was cry at that point. I went to different counsellors and therapists. The end of my eighth grade year was me going to doctor after doctor, but I was too scared to explain why and or talk about what I felt in fear of getting yelled or ridiculed at. This led to my diagnosis of bulimia, clinically severe depression, and generalised anxiety disorder. I wish this had a happier ending. My mom, I love her so much, she's straight up a mama bear, full on reprimanding my dad was definitely a relief, because it felt like she was saying all the things I wish I could say. Before people ask, I am doing so much better now, while I still have a nasty fear of getting yelled at. I stopped purging and starving myself, and I'm over five years strong. After all this crap happened, I left dance in pursuit of drawing and animal care. I was finding myself, and by the beginning of my freshman year of high school, finally realized how dysphoric I felt about my body and sex. I came out to my mom as transgender. She was very supportive and tries her best. As for dad? Well, that very religious evil stepmother. All that is a story for another day. Posted by user, Russian Anna B. Titled, Daughter was six hours late to interview. Entitled mother yells at me for making her cry. Hello everyone, long time creeper on here. Never thought I'd run into an entitled mum, EM, but here we are. So I'm 20 female. I am a dog groomer. Been one for four, almost five years. The big thing is, dog grooming is reputation, quality, and time management. Yesterday, we were expecting a girl to come in at 10 to try out as a dog groomer. She was promising. 23 or 25 years old, worked as a dog groomer at other places. She didn't show until 4.30. No call, no nothing. She apparently had a hair appointment, and her friends from out of town came in so they got their nails done. She asked if she could groom now. I said no, I don't think so. When she pressed, I said, and I might be a jerk for saying this, we don't want or need you. There's no need to reschedule your tryout. I went back to get my last two dogs done. Apparently she cried, and I was starting to feel bad. Now is the entitled mother time. Her mum came in this morning demanding we give her a second chance. I told her, your daughter was six and a half hours late, that's not something that works in dog grooming. Entitled mother replied, She was with friends. I'd think someone your age would understand that. I say, not when there's a job interview. She didn't call or anything. 
At this point, I was ticked and over it. I have five dogs to get done. She said, well, there was no reason to make her cry. I said I disagree and got back to work. Apparently, she stayed up there and demanded we give her another shot. As head dog groomer, I said not gonna happen. She left eventually, saying her daughter was too good for us. Posted by user Skillet2003. Titled, Entitled Dad Threatens to Call the Cops Over Lunchbox. This is my first post on Reddit, and I created my account specifically to post this story here, cause it's crazy. It takes place at my summer job at a day camp. I was and am a high school student at the time of writing this. I still work there, so I have to be a little careful about giving away too much and identifying the business. It was over a year ago too, so some of the finer details might be misremembered. The interaction is mainly between my boss, the head counsellor, and the dad. The cast are, Entitled Dad, Mike, my boss, the head counsellor, Sam, the Entitled Dad's kid, I don't want to call him Entitled Kid, as I really blame the parenting here, and he wasn't bad at all in this story. And the other counsellors and I. As I mentioned, I'm mostly an observer here. So it's the end of the day on Friday. Camp normally ends at 3, the counsellors leave at 3.15, and Mike will stay with the kids in aftercare until the last kid gets picked up by 6. However, on Fridays, the counsellors all stay late to clean up usually until around 5 or 6. The kids in aftercare just play by themselves, or we put on some cartoons. Mike usually plays with them, but as mentioned, Friday is cleanup day. We are all cleaning up, and slowly the parents of kids in aftercare are trickling in to pick their kids up. Sam is just hanging out. Now, we had another kid in the camp, Isaac. His parents had already picked him up, he and Sam had this same model lunchbox. We didn't have a problem with this until today. Entitled Dad comes to pick up Sam and goes to get his lunchbox from the table. He picks it up, marches to Mike and says, This is not my kid's lunchbox. Mike sighs and says calmly, I'm sorry, we had another kid this week, Isaac, who had the same lunchbox. I guess that's Isaac's lunchbox you're holding. Entitled Dad scoffs, oh, and says, obviously, now get my kid's lunchbox back, and starts to walk out with Isaac's lunchbox. Mike rushes forward saying, um, I can call Isaac's parents, but I'm gonna need you to leave his lunchbox here. Um, no, they have my kid's lunchbox, I have theirs. This is my insurance I get my kid's lunchbox back. I will give it back when they give me my kid's. I'll wait for them to come here. Mike is flabbergasted. All the counsellors are listening, but pretending not to so we don't get involved. Mike says, Well, it might be a while to get a hold of Isaac's parents. They only left five minutes ago, so they could still be driving and not pick up the phone. Well then, I'm not waiting. I'm leaving. You have my address, I give you my permission to give them my address, and they can come to my house and make the exchange. Mike says, I can't let you leave the premises with another kid's property. Why not? You let that family leave with my kid's property? I don't think I've ever seen Mike more confused, and he says, That was an accident. I can't knowingly let you leave with that lunchbox. Oh, you guys are lucky I'm not calling the cops. I'm sorry? Your negligence let another family steal my kid's lunchbox. Mike is starting to get a little upset and says, Sir, mistakes happen. Again, I apologize for this inconvenience, but there was no crime committed here. This goes on for a few minutes. Eventually, Mike pulls a 1000 IQ move. He was studying to get his master's in elementary education. He knows how to handle temper tantrums. And he says, All right, sir. I'll see what I can do. In the meantime, would you mind signing Sam out? He hands Entitled Dad a pen and a clipboard with the sign out sheet. To sign it, Entitled Dad has to set the lunchbox down on the table. Entitled Dad, of course, didn't notice and falls for it. While he's signing Sam out, Mike quietly takes Isaac's lunchbox and sets it safely behind him. 
entitled Dad Never Notices. Then, Mike checks the contact list and calls Isaac's parents. His end of the conversation goes something like this. Hi Isaac's mum, this is Mike from camp. I believe I have Isaac's lunchbox here. Yeah. He and another kid had the same lunchbox, so you probably have his. Oh, no worries. When do you think you'll be able to drop it off? Oh, really? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, no worries. See you shortly. Bye. He turns and looks at Entitled Dad. In an impressively calm voice, he states, They will be back shortly to pick up Isaac's lunchbox, but they do not have Sam's. Isaac just forgot to grab his. It was so silent, you could hear a pin drop. The other counsellors and I froze for a second, but managed to keep up the facade of, We're just working here. Don't mind us. Entitled Dad freezes for a moment, unsure of what to do. I can see the little gears turning in his head. He comes to his epic conclusion, well then it must be here. Genius. He starts tearing around the room, looking everywhere from the lunchbox table, to the play area, to the game shelves, to the office where the kids aren't even allowed in. Everywhere. Mind you, we had been cleaning up, and so everything was very neat and tidy. Was. While this is going on, Mike decides a different strategy. While Entitled Dad is dismantling the last hour of cleaning and tidying, Mike crouches down next to Sam. During all of this, Sam had just been quietly playing with some toys. He was around six? And Mike says, Hey buddy, do you remember where you put your lunchbox? And Sam nods. And Mike says, oh, Where is it? On the kitchen table. Everything stopped. The other counsellors and I couldn't maintain our indifferent facade any longer. We just froze. Half of us staring at Sam, the other half glared at Entitled Dad. You don't talk to Mike or anyone at this camp like that and get away with it. Now, I briefly want to talk about Mike. He's probably one of the most chill, funniest, silliest teachers and counsellors you could find. Absolutely perfect for a job like this. He could entertain the kids for hours, break up arguments, anything. He would put on these funny personas and act out scenes with them. He was also my first career mentor figure that I had and gave me some great advice. If I was older, I'd say he's the type of guy I could grab a beer with. Just so relaxed and a great guy. He deserves all the praise in the world. I wish I could name him, but that would reveal too much. However, when he stood up, there was a look on his face I had never seen before. Gone was the silliness. Gone was the fun. All gone was the tolerance for this entitled dad. In the most deadly calm voice that practically shouted anything but calm, he said, Sam says his lunchbox is on the kitchen table, in your house. He says he never brought the lunchbox to camp today. The lunchbox isn't here. Entitled Dad once again freezes. His face goes white, then red, then blue. Guess he was still feeling some of that 4th of July spirit. He stutters for a bit before turning to Sam. He said, Now, look at this. You've made me look stupid. It was at that moment I lost all little remaining spect for this guy. It was also at that moment I felt bad for Sam. Throughout the week, Sam had been a less than stellar camper. He threw tantrums, was entitled, didn't follow the rules very well, etc. All frustration I had for him was replaced by pity. He had been raised in a house where his father's mistakes and actions led to him being blamed. He had been raised by a man so entitled, he would throw tantrums over a child's lunchbox. That's why I'm not calling him Entitled Kid in this story. He deserves much better. Anyways, Mike manages to put a stop to that quickly by just stepping behind them and non-physically urging them towards the door. Entitled Dad doesn't get the memo and turns to Mike. I still had some hope Entitled Dad would apologize? Nope. Entitled Dad decided it was time for small talk. He says, So Mike, you in college? A stunned Mike says, "Uh, Yes. What are you studying? 
I'm getting my master's in elementary education. Oh, cool. What's it like? Great. We learn how to deal with childhood behavior all the time, such as exploration of the world, strengthening communication skills, tantrums. He put emphasis on that last part. Entitled Dad finally got the hint and walked out. We all looked at each other like, what the hell just happened? Mike just shook his head, called his boss, the CEO, to tell her what happened just in case, and then we went back to normal. I later asked him about Entitled Dad, and he said that apparently the family is really wealthy and buys a spot for their kids every week in the summer. Then, they decide whether or not they want to show up that week, not bothering to ask for a refund. Huh, some families. Posted by user Kai Chloe, titled, My Cousin is Probably Entitled. EM is my cousin, SM is staff member. So, my cousin recently got married and had a child. Yay. However, both me and my mum have a feeling that she's probably going to turn out as an entitled mother. One, she refused to pick up her baby because he's too gloopy. And two, whenever her two-month-old child starts crying, she doesn't help the child because she doesn't want the child to be spoiled. WTF. So, on to the actual story. My cousin wants to take her literal fifth major because of this one incident. One day, she went to one of those big grocery stores in China, which have a lot of random things. A lot of them have random things from pianos to actual groceries to scooters. So she went to one of those to buy baby clothes. She goes in and sees baby clothes that she likes and are in correct size. But they fell on the floor and she picked them up. Entitled mother calls over the store manager and the store manager says, Hi, how can I help you? I want you to give me a different set of clothes. The manager checks on a device if they have more. She walked into the storage room and checked the device by the way and says, I'm sorry ma'am, we don't have any more of those. Well, that's not good enough. These fell on the floor. Normally, these floors are really well cleaned, so there might be a few specks of dirt on the clothing. And I demand that you bring me a new set or wash these for me now. I'm really sorry, ma'am, but there are no new pairs, so I'm not sure how to help you. Well, you better import a new pair immediately, or I'll give your supermarket a bad review. And that's the end of the story from what I heard. How do I know? Well, my cousin tells this to our family group chat, bragging. I swear, she starts bragging that she yelled at a supermarket staff member over not being bothered to wash newly bought clothes. Does anyone have any idea how to de my cousin? Posted by user Kitty Lebowski, titled, My parents took me out to dinner to question my political views. So my parents started harassing me about voting. I told them I was going to. They kept bugging me about who I'm voting for. I shut them down, and as we are leaving the restaurant, my father yells, If you love us, you will vote for Trump! Of course, everyone in the restaurant thought this was hilarious. Posted by user, Dad Beats Me 69 titled, I Work at KFC. It was Employee Appreciation Week, and my work had given us water bottles and balloons that were hung out front. Keep in mind, our front part was closed. Only the drive through window was open due to the pandemic. Now, this was in the middle of a rush, and I was trying to get this woman out as fast as I could because other customers were waiting. And one of the children sees a balloon, and asks if they can have one. I said I couldn't because I wasn't supposed to give them away. So this lady goes... It's just one balloon, it couldn't hurt that much. And I apologized and said I couldn't do it. She then proceeded to yell at me while her child was screaming in the back seat, and my manager was brought out. She apologized to the lady and gave her a free cookie, and said that she couldn't give away the balloons. Now, we have a survey where you can review certain employees by name, and the very next day, I had a one-star rating and a very angry story about me being rude and entitled. All because I wouldn't give this child a balloon. Posted by user 
Bella791, titled, Parents Just Assuming That You Will. One of my biggest pet peeves that my parents used to do, and something my boyfriend's parents do, is just assuming you'll be able to do something for them without asking. I do not think it is bad for a parent to ask their kid to help out. For instance, watching siblings running errands, etc. But for the love of God, tell them first. You can't just wait until five minutes before you need something done and spring it on them last minute. We are humans and we have lives too. My boyfriend is 20 and today we were supposed to hang out when I got back from the store. I just got back and he gets in his car to come over and his mother calls and says that he can't leave because she needs him to wait until his brother is ready to be picked up from his friend's house and drive him home. If she would have asked earlier, it would be no big deal. Hey, I need you to pick your brother up from his friend's house later. Easy, simple communication. But no, they have to wait until he is about to drive away. They do this all the time with every little thing, and it is insanely frustrating. They will last minute, without warning, demand he watch his brothers for hours, when we already had plans. And if he says he has plans, they're like, oh well, just change them or cancel. Like wholly entitled. Generally, when you need people to do stuff for you, it's nice to effing ask first. Posted by user Pipoka Quemada, titled, Entitled Mother Gets Mad That I'm On My Period. This happened before pandemic. The car star, my friend, entitled mum, me, myself, and I. So, I decided to stay over at my friend's house for the weekend. I had forgotten to put extra tampons in my bag. I arrive, and for the most part, everything was alright. I already knew Entitled Mother was entitled sometimes, because my friend told me, but I never saw it. We were just talking and watching Netflix, and the urge to go to the bathroom hit me. I then realised that, yup, that was my period. I asked my friend if I could use one of her tampons because I forgot to bring some. My friend gave me one, and I thought everything was okay. A few minutes go by, and my friend and me are in the living room, when Entitled Mother comes running from my friend's bedroom. Apparently, she was going through a daily inspection of my friend's bedroom and noticed my friend was down one tampon. My friend already told me about her mother basically being a control freak, and if anything was out of the ordinary, my friend would get punished. So she comes into the living room and says, Why is one of your tampons missing? Um, OP borrowed one? I am now uncomfortable. And Entitled Mother says, Well, you know that you're not supposed to give away tampons. Mom, there's no big deal, it's just one. If she was planning on menstruating, then she should have brought her own. I'm now super uncomfortable and I say, Well, I forgot to keep track and I just borrowed one. Mom, it's just one damn thing. It doesn't affect your life in any way whatsoever. Ugh, but this is coming out of your pocket. I don't buy you tampons so you can just give them away. Mom, why are you always like this? It's just one thing. Entitled mother looking at me says, We'll talk after your friend leaves. And she leaves the room. After Entitled Mother left, the air was super awkward, but me and my friend were able to jerk it out. After I left, my friends told me that Entitled Mother demanded that my friend give her one pound for the tampon, and it's safe to assume that I never went back to her house. Posted by user BillOL. Titled, Entitled Guy Tells Me to Shut Up Because I'm a Female. So we had organised a board games night with some friends. I knew less than half of the people who were there, but it was a chill mood. We all got something to eat and drink. After the meal, we started playing a game in which trading is a very important part. The game is called Catan. As we were too many to play, we made teams of two, and my team was made of the only females present that day, me and my friend. We started playing, and the Entitled Guy's team is really slow to play, which annoys everyone. We start putting timers so they don't spend more than 7 minutes playing their turn, but they just ignore when the time is up. I start telling them to hurry, and that it makes the game no fun, but of course they don't listen. I still think it annoyed them a bit. 
We keep playing like that until my team starts being ahead and starts winning the game. Then comes the trading part of the Entitled Guys team, and the two other teams start trading. I say that I'll accept the trade, which the other team didn't want to, and the Entitled Guys team was trying to convince the other team, and he tells me to shut up because the men are talking. He then used this sentence every time I was trying to trade, as he saw that I found it really disrespectful. He then proceeded to lose the game, and I proceeded to win it. Posted by user Duct Tape Cat, titled "Entitled Kid Rips Turban Off of Seek Friend Gets Expelled." So, if you didn't know, in the Seek religion, men wear turbans because they grow their hair throughout their entire life, and hair is considered sacred. Turbans are used to protect their hair, and it holds a symbolic value. Well, my friend, who we'll call H, is just a normal kid. He doesn't have an Indian accent or anything. He grew up in Canada, so he had the English American accents. During middle school, he liked Yu-Gi-Oh, and he is an amazing artist. This though occurred during elementary, K to grade five. So there is this kid who we'll call Jason. Jason is an absolute issue. He would complain when we played Manhunt. If we tagged, he would say, "Ow, my leg hurts. I can't be the tagger." Well, during lunch, he decided it would be funny to pull at my friend's H's turban. When he pulled it, everything went loose. Instead of people laughing with him, we were all in shock. My friend was in tears, so a teacher hurriedly brought him into the school to help put it back together. However, Jason was in super big trouble. He was sent to the principal's office and had either an in-school suspension or was expelled. Either way, H got proper justice. Posted by user Mammy Jam, titled "The Metric System Doesn't Care About Your Entitlement." So this was a few years ago when me and my wife, both Mancunian, were doing a mini world tour as a part of our honeymoon. We were in Iceland and had been really disappointed to find out that the Blue Lagoon is man-made and is basically just a large outdoor swimming pool or water runoff from the geothermal plant. So after some light googling, found a place about an hour and a half drive from Reykjavik called the Secret Lagoon. The place is amazing and exactly what I expected from a natural hot spring. Basically, a large pond pouring with steam, a river running next to it also pouring with steam, and then a load of smaller bubbling pools of water and mini geysers that would blast water into the air every ten minutes or so. The place is on somebody's land, and they've built a changing room and shower area, and charge about twelve pound to get in. Between the pond and the river, there is a roped-off area of small, deep pools that has a sign saying. Warning: Water is over 90 degrees. Do not enter at your own risk. Which is probably a bad translation of no entry. We accept no liability. Anyway, me and my wife were leaning against the side of the pond closest to this, and noticed a guy wander up, read the sign, and then step over the rope. As he's walking up to one of the small pools, the lifeguard is running over and shouting, "Stop! Stop! You can't go in there!" Then American accent replies. Whatever, buddy. I can do whatever I want. By this time, the lifeguard has reached him and tries to explain to him that the water is between 90 and 110 degrees, and that he walked right past a "Do not enter" sign. To which the American responds, "No, it says enter at your own risk. So I am, and it's not very risky. It's hotter than 90 degrees in Nevada every day." This utterly perplexes the lifeguard. Who has absolutely no idea what the hell the American is talking about? So I shout over, "Oi, mate! It's Celsius, not Fahrenheit." Now the American looks confused and says, "I don't know what that is. I'm going in." For reference, 90 to 110 degrees Celsius is 194 to 230 degrees Fahrenheit. Then follows about five minutes of arguing between the American and the lifeguard before the American obviously thinks. F this takes two step further to the pool and goes to put his foot in. 
Fortunately for him, but unfortunately for Darwinism, he only manages to dip a toe in before screaming in pain and hopping back to the changing room in a half. The lifeguard sighs and goes back to his chair. What a fudging divvy! Posted by user OrchidWolf99 Titled, Entitled person wants to put down all pit bulls and tells a young pregnant girl to get an abortion or enjoy being homeless. After a run-in with this user myself, I decided to dig a little deeper and oh boy do they make my blood boil. This particular user is a moderator on multiple subreddits to do with receiving funds, but I really don't think they should be. First was a post of a young girl who had recently found out she was pregnant and had been disowned by her family because of it. She reached out to the internet for help and posted her crowdfunding onto one of the subreddits that this user moderated. The user commented by telling her to get an abortion if she's not in a good place to raise a child. Now, I agree that it's unfair to bring a child into the world if you're not ready to look after it, but... This young woman was already pregnant and decided to keep the baby when her family had disowned her. I can't imagine the damage that an attack to her mental health that a comment like that could do. When the girl replied to the user saying she wanted to keep her baby, the user replied by saying, well, good luck being poor and homeless. Another person had posted about their loving pit bull that needed a new home for whatever reason, and this user called it a scam because... Pit bulls are not living animals, and should be banned and put down. Even claimed the post needed to be removed because of the red flags, because they gave positive traits that couldn't be true of a pit bull? The cruelty to an innocent animal just because of its breed particularly got to me, as my personal encounter with them was regarding a crowdfunder for my emotional support animal. They told me to give him away because they were a pet owner themselves, and as my pet was just a rabbit, I couldn't really be that attached to it because it's just a rabbit. Jesus. I explained that I was very much attached to him. I have panic attacks if I leave home without him, and I'm only asking for the help, as during the beginning of the pandemic, I had donated over £2,000 of my savings to people in need not knowing that I would come to need that money now, but they continued with their insensitive comments. There is plenty more stories of them attacking people in the comments of fundraising requests that clearly follow community guidelines for the subreddits they moderate, as well as plenty of posts they've removed under false pretenses. How do people like that become moderators? I was always taught if you have nothing nice to say, don't say it. No need to attack people asking for help. If you don't want to donate, then just keep scrolling. People will understand. I do hope that young mother-to-be is okay, though. I donated a small amount to her to apologize for her having to deal with someone saying things like that. Posted by user Colby Road Tech. Titled, Karen Gets Arrested by Native Cop. Disclaimer, I'm not First Nations, I'm very Caucasian. This will make sense later on. So I work at a marina on a native reserve. The kind of marina that has a pump for boats and cars, and it's full service, meaning we go out and pump gas for the customers. We are in the same plaza as a restaurant, a tobacco shop, and a cannabis store, all on First Nations land, and owned by the reserve. Super easy going place. The management takes such good care of their employees. Like, I couldn't ask for a better job. Yesterday, me and a co-worker were going back and forth from Lakeside Pump to Roadside Pump. We were packed since it was Saturday of the Canadian Thanksgiving weekend, and everyone was going out on their boat or going to their cottage on the reserve one last time before winter. On busy weekends like these, we have a police officer in the plaza to make sure that people don't do stupid crap. Because of the pandemic, the reserve is only open to residents and people who own property on the reserve. People constantly try to sneak onto the reserve or park in the private marina parking lot, and that's why the police officer is here, to keep the idiot tourists at bay. We'll call the cop NC, native cop. NC is a super great guy. As someone who's not fond of police myself, I can vouch that this guy is one of the good ones. 
So, during a big rush of customers, Entitled Karen pulls up. So, quick backstory. According to my boss, Entitled Karen came to the pot shop every other day and would always complain about bad product or some BS like that. So when she pulls up, instead of telling me she's getting gas, she just walks away. I call back asking if she's getting gas, and the conversation goes along the lines of, <clears throat> Excuse me, ma'am. Sorry, um, are you getting gas? Heh, <laughs> no. And she continues to walk off. Meanwhile, there is a line of cars behind her. I say, I'm sorry, but if that's the case, you're going to have to move your car. We have other people waiting for gas. Entitled Karen continues to walk off towards the other side of the plaza. At this point, NC sees what's going on and goes to talk to her. I see a wave of realization wash over NC's face as he stops her. The conversation is out of earshot, but I heard something along the lines of, How am I supposed to know? I know my rights. From Entitled Karen. And, Ma'am, you're banned from these premises. From NC. They move back to the car. Meanwhile, I'm trying to calm down people in line who are all pissed off that this car is in the way. NC says, Ma'am, for the last time, you were banned from the premises for 30 days. That was nine days ago, and you still have three weeks until you're allowed on First Nations land. And she says, But I wasn't on Plaza property yet. I'm just at the gas shack. What right do you have to talk to me that way? From that tree to that tree is also native land, and thus Plaza property. He gestures to two trees on either side of the asphalt lot. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. What, so now an Indian can arrest a white woman? Am I right, man? As she gestures towards me, I, obviously taken aback, say nothing. Hm, <laughs> traitor, she mumbles. You don't understand how they treated me back there. NC says, for the last time, you've been banned from the entirety of the plaza. You can come back in three weeks, but you have to leave the premises immediately. But you're not even a real cop. You don't have any authority on me. Get off your power trip, Indian. I assure you, ma'am, that I am a part of the Reserve's Police Department, and if need be, I have full authority to arrest you as any other police officer would. Oh yeah, sure, buddy. I'm suing the plaza, and I'm getting you all fired. And she gestures to me too, who up to this point was back inside with a guy paying for his boat's gas and snacks. And C says, that's fine, ma'am, but if you don't leave, I will have to arrest you. And if you come back within the next three weeks, you will also be arrested. Realizing he called her bluff, she huffs, sits back in her car, and mumbles something like, effing redskins, and drives off. And that's the end of the story for today. The next day, the day as I'm writing this, it's dead slow. I mean, I've been watching Netflix all shift. Until I see my co-worker walking over from the parking lot to start his shift. Behind him, I see Entitled Karen being put up against a car screaming, as NC cuffs her. It's just barely out of earshot, but I see NC say what I'm assuming is the whole, you have the right to remain silent, blah blah blah. As this is happening, I can hear Entitled Karen yelling. What, so I'm getting arrested by an Indian cop? What a load of crap. I'm getting you fired. I'll fudging sue everyone. And NC pulls her over to the side of the parking lot, where I'm assuming the car was parked. It was far enough away that I couldn't see it behind the other cars, but could still hear EK yelling obscenities. NC filled me in on the details later, saying that she came back wanting to videotape the pot shop and all the health hazards, bad product, and health and safety issues there. Mind you, the process to open a cannabis store is meticulous. They won't let you open if anything is short of perfect, from what I understand. This store hasn't even been open for a year, and all the equipment and everything is brand new. So NC gets wind of this and came back to arrest her. As he restrains her, she starts dialing 911. I repeat, she calls the cops on the cops. Her justification, he's an Indian cop, not a real cop. So NC has to talk to the other police departments, then clear things up with them. Meanwhile, EK is screaming in the background. They later released her and are extending the ban indefinitely. 
Me and my coworker are laughing our butts off, as this is going to be a fun story to tell at a Thanksgiving dinner. Posted by user Seda Bassist. Titled, My Entitled Mother Was Afraid of Doctors and I Nearly Died from a Muscle Cramp. My mother, the entitled mother of our tale, grew up in a household that didn't believe in doctors or going to the hospital. This translated to an irrational fear of hospitals for my entitled mother. At the time of this story, I was 14, in high school, and about to have a very bad day. I should start by saying that my entitled mother lives exactly one mile away from the closest emergency room. Also, my siblings and father were out of town for a competition that weekend. I didn't feel like going to another cheerleading competition, so I stayed home. I get home from school on a Friday at around 4pm and call entitled mother to tell her that I don't feel good and think that I need to see a doctor. Entitled mother says that she has a one hour workout with her personal trainer, who happens to train the whole family for our sports teams. Entitled mother tells me that she will come home right after and take me to the pediatrician. 4.40pm, I call entitled mother saying that something is seriously wrong with me and I really think I need to go to the hospital. She tells me that PT just had a cancellation, and she's staying for another hour workout, then she will take me to the doctor. 5.10pm, I call Entitled Mother and beg her to come home, because I'm in a lot of pain and feel terrible. She gives the phone over to PT, who says, I, I crap you not. It sounds like a muscle cramp from our workout last week. Ugh, you'll be fine, buddy. She then says she'll call our friendly neighbor, FN, across the street to check on me. Ten minutes later, I hear FN walk through the door and come to my room to check me out. I'm on the floor because I fell after going to the bathroom and couldn't get up. She helps me into the bed and immediately calls Entitled Mother. The convo goes something like this. <clears throat> hey, Entitled Mother, I think you need to get here ASAP. Your son is as white as a sheet and sweating bullets. Also, he's in so much pain he can barely move. Oh, I'm, I'm sure he's fine. Probably just overreacting from a muscle cramp like the PT says. Mate, this isn't just a muscle cramp. He needs to see a doctor. I can put him in my car and meet you at the hospital ER that's only one mile away. Oh, no need for that. I'll finish up here and head home to take him to the doctor. Click. 5.45pm. Friendly neighbor calls Entitled Mother again, and Entitled Mother says that she's in the changing room, then will be home in 10 minutes. The gym is pretty close. 6.20 p.m. Entitled Mother finally gets home. FN tells her what I've been going through and says that I need to go to the emergency room. Entitled Mother says she's taking me to see our pediatrician. Entitled Mother does take me to see our pediatrician, who also runs a pediatric ER. The problem is, is that the doctor's office is 25 minutes drive away with zero traffic. We're at the arse end of a rush hour. 7.15ish p.m., we get to the pediatric ER, and they immediately take me into the back to see what's wrong. Turns out, I have an acute appendicitis, and it's close to bursting, so they need to send me over to the hospital one mile from my house to get it removed. The entire time, my entitled mother is murmuring about needing to get ready for a trail the next day. She's a divorce lawyer, and how I'll probably be fine and just need to sleep it off. Then there comes a moment when Entitled Mother is out of the room, but I have a doctor and a nurse in the room alone with me. I tell them the whole story about how I've been trying to get her to take me to the ER since four, how we lived only a mile from the hospital they wanted to send me to, but my Entitled Mother decided to go here because she hates big hospitals. The doctor didn't really believe me until I told him to map quest my address relative to the hospital. I managed to convince them to call for an ambulance to transport me to the hospital to make sure I got there. After my surgery, the nurse told me that my appendix burst as they began the surgery so they had to be quick. To this day, I still tease PT every time I see him by grabbing my side and saying I think I have a muscle cramp. I've never heard him use those words together since. Posted by user MistyDC. Titled... Crazy dog owner abandons her dog in a shop for hours, then goes mental when she's told the boss is not happy. We shall call the subject of this story, Arsehat. 
So this happened earlier this year, just before lockdown. Which is lucky for Arshat, or they may have been charged with a terror crime. I work in a shop that sells hardware, and doesn't have an issue with people bringing their dogs in. I personally love dogs, and don't have one, so take every opportunity for a bit of a cuddle. So I'm on my own in the shop one day when Arsat comes in to discuss some work she had asked us to carry out for her. She's got two dogs with her. One is a big lab cross, and the other is a smaller lab terrier of some sort. I coo over the dogs, and we get to discussing her job requirements. Once that's done, we chat for a while about dogs and all as well. Whilst we're chatting, she spots something in the shop that she likes and wants to buy. I give her a price and she says she has no cash and needs to go home and get some. I don't live far, she says. Just then the phone rings, so I answer and while I'm talking to the caller, she plonks the small dog on the counter and tells me that it's too tired to walk any further and I can look after it while she goes to get the money. I grudgingly agree because A, I can't really argue while I'm still trying to talk to the other customer and B, she doesn't live far. Remember these words. So, off she goes. Fifteen minutes later, I'm now holding the little dog who, getting a little stressed at the disappearance of Arshat, keeps making a break for the door. Another five minutes go by and no sign of her. Then another ten and still nothing. So I poke my head out of the door to see if she's walking down the road. Nope, nothing. I wait and wait. An hour after she left, it's approaching closing time, and here I am on a Friday afternoon with a virtual stranger's whimpering dog in my arms. I couldn't put it down because we're on a busy road, and it made a beeline for the door as soon as I did. All through this, I had other customers come in, and I had to perch the dog on the counter while I served them. One lady even had to hold the dog for me whilst I carried out her order. So, I try to call Arshat's phone. No answer. Leave a message. Another half hour goes by and nothing. I try the phone again and nothing. Finally, on the third try, she answers and I ask her when she's going to be back as she was just popping home to get some cash. Oh, sorry, she says. When I got home, I needed to help my elderly neighbor with some gardening. I'm on my way. Great, I think. Won't be long now. Just then, my boss arrives home from his works out on site and asks why the hell am I holding a small white dog and who the hell does it belong to. I explain the situation and he's calm but not particularly happy. He also tells me that Arshat actually lives about a 45 minute walk away. Fan bloody tastic. Eventually, five minutes after closing time, just as I was making plans to take the dog home for the weekend, Arshat walks in the door. Not a care in the world, no apology, nothing. I just want to get rid of her and get home, so I'm polite but not friendly. I hand the dog over and try to hustle her out of the door. My boss, on the other hand, does not like people who take the piss, so he tells her that he's given me a verbal warning because I agreed to look after the dog and it was her fault. He hadn't, but she didn't know that. She goes nuts. I mean like from calm and smiling to bat crap crazy in two seconds flat. She starts screeching about what a racist, sexist pig he is. Honestly, neither my boss nor I had any idea that she was of a different race to us and I'm still not convinced. She rants and raves, flinging abuse like a monkey throws crap at the zoo and eventually storms out. My boss watches her go, then calmly closes and locks the door. Ten seconds later, she's back because she's just realized she left her phone inside. She slams into the glass door to throw it open, but it's locked, so she hits it hard. Then she steps back, hisses like a cat, and spits on the door handle, then leaves without the phone. I didn't ever want to engage with her again, so I took the phone out to her at the bus stop. She tried to carry on the tirade, but I shut her down and went home. Posted by user Stormy Onyx, titled, Entitled Karen Pushes Me Out of Electric Cart. So this just happened at my local grocery store, and I'm still fuming over it, so please forgive any typos or strong language that may be used. For reference, I have a hereditary connective tissue disorder, 
H-E-D-S, that makes my tendons, ligaments, skin, some veins, and other connective tissue very loose and stretchy. This causes chronic pain, frequent dislocations, hyperextensions, and generally loose joints. I also have a degenerative disc disease and a comorbid form of dysautonomia, POTS, that makes my heart race every time I'm standing and can eventually cause me to pass out if I'm standing for too long. I can walk, but I have to use a cane when I do because I can't walk very well or for very long. My knees don't like to support my body weight, and I can very easily dislocate a knee or a hip if I step ever so slightly wrong or happen to trip over anything. Because of this, I tend to use my wheelchair for longer outings. Thankfully, my local grocery store has those electric carts that customers can ride around on in the store, so I don't have to go to the trouble of hauling my wheelchair out of the car and can just use one of those. So I'm in the store, doing some grocery shopping, minding my own business. I wasn't even really paying attention to the people around me because I just wanted to get what I needed and get out. One of the items I needed happened to be on the top shelf, so I got up out of the electric cart to get it off the shelf. The next thing I know, this fudging Karen flips her crap, because those carts are for people who need them, not kids who just want to take them for a joyride. I should add here that if you didn't know me, or you've never seen me attempt to walk, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with me. Other than the way I walk, I look perfectly healthy to the casual observer. Now, I get this kind of thing all the time when I'm using one of the store's electric carts, so I just rolled my eyes and told her that I do need it, and started to move along to get the rest of my shopping done. Surprise, surprise, that wasn't the end of it. The next thing I know, this biz hands were on my shoulders, and she gave me a hefty shove and fudging pushed me so hard, I fell out of the cart. Now I'm just sitting there, on the floor, stunned, while this woman yells obscenities at me in between generally incoherent ramblings about idiotic college kids. Thankfully at this point, my boyfriend came back from grabbing milk. He rounded the corner into the aisle and saw what was going on, and from the look on his face, I'm surprised he didn't deck the tramp. The subsequent argument went something like this. My boyfriend says, Excuse me, what the F do you think you're doing? This little brat thinks it's okay to steal carts from disabled folks. He is disabled, you fudging dumbo. I saw him get up to reach for something. He's obviously faking it. You thick mother effer. You think just because he can stand means he doesn't need a cart? And you think that gives you the right to assault him? What the F is wrong with you? Boyfriend then proceeds to ask me if I want him to call the cops. Lady starts freaking out over the possibility of actual real live assault charges, and I guess the commotion was enough that at that point, one of the store's managers decided to get involved. He sees me still on the floor asks what's going on, and when my boyfriend explained what had happened, also asks me if I wanted to call the authorities. At this point, I had had enough, was pretty shaken up and on the verge of crying, which I don't like to do in public, and just wanted to go home. At the end of all of this, the store manager comped my groceries, banned Karen from the store, and told me that all the other stores from the chain that were in the area did too. I've had people give me the side eye, or go as far as to chide me for using the store's electric carts before, but I have never had anyone put their hands on me until now. It makes me so mad, because this woman literally just saw me stand up to reach something, and apparently that was reason enough for her to feel the need to physically remove me from the mobility aid that I was using. Now, like I said, to the casual observer, I don't look disabled. Unless you saw me walking or saw me dislocate something, you probably wouldn't know there was anything wrong with me. It just makes me so angry, because people ought to know that invisible illnesses exist, and that not all disabilities can be outwardly seen. Also, just because someone can stand up, doesn't mean they don't need a wheelchair. It's not like only people who are paralyzed have the right to use one. And even if it was just an idiot college kid taking an electric cart for a spin, that still doesn't give someone the right to push me out of it. If you think I shouldn't be using it, go get a manager or something. Or better yet, mind your own damn business and find your own damn shopping. 
I shouldn't have to explain my disability to everyone who sees me using a mobility aid. That happens a lot, even when I'm just using my cane. Random strangers will ask me what happened or how I hurt myself. My go-to answer and shutdown for that is now, I was born. And I especially shouldn't have to fear for my physical safety every time I need to go grocery shopping. Anyway, sorry if this was long-winded or ranty. Crap was infuriating. Posted by user Forever Souls Raven, titled, I thought we were touching each other inappropriately. Now, thanks to a post I just read, I remembered this story that happened a while back, but we still laugh at it. In all honesty, I don't think I ever laughed this hard in my life at Walmart. Our car star, MVP, my very pregnant friend, me, the magical entity, and Kay, Karen. My friend at this time was about eight months prego, and she was huge. I loved watching her waddle, it was kinda cute. I went to Walmart with her because she needed a few things, and needed help carrying them. Then enters the dreaded Karen. Karen's like, aw, you're pregnant! My pregnant friend looks at her belly, and I should mention my friend is sarcastic, smart-assed as it gets, and says, well, what do you know? I am! I'm just standing there holding things. Karen says, I want to touch your belly. No, you're not. Karen gives the look and says, what do you mean I can't touch your belly? Because I said so, and just try and see what happens. Apparently, this Karen was dumb enough to take the bait and touched my friend's pregnant belly. At the moment Karen's hand touched my friend's pregnant belly, my pregnant friend grabbed Karen's ass and gave it a squeeze. I'm losing my crap because of Karen's face in horrified shock, and she starts banshee screaming, saying, What the F is wrong with you? Why did you just grab my ass? Oh, I thought we were inappropriately touching each other. I mean, I asked you and told you not to touch me, but you did anyway. So since you can touch me, I can touch you, right? I mean, that's your logic. I am now speechless and gasping for air from laughing, including some bystanders. Karen is literally speechless like a fish out of water. My pregnant friend just looked at me and said, let's go. I don't think I've ever enjoyed a Walmart trip as much as I did this one. Posted by user, I'm the true firestarter, titled, Karen's step-parent doesn't let me speak and lies to try to get me in trouble. So my parents divorced when I was very little, and my dad got remarried to another woman, who turned out to be a Karen. She didn't start acting like one towards me until I was much older though, around seven or eight. My dad eventually divorced her, but not until I was 12. It's a long story. Anyway... I have many stories about her. I will probably tell those some other time, but here is my first one. So first, I was 10 or 11 at the time, and I'm very socially awkward. I have Asperger's, and at the time, I was undiagnosed. Anyway, it was a Sunday night, and I was putting my clothes away in my closet like a good child I was trying to be. Eventually, I finished up and went into the other room to watch TV. A few minutes later, Karen comes in upset and tells me to come back to my room. I follow her into my open closet, and this is how the conversation follows. Karen says, Want to tell me why you put your clothes up wrong? I'm confused and nervous as hell and say, w What do you mean? Karen grabs a shirt off the hanger and says, You put your shirts on wrong and now you have stretched it. In truth, I don't really care how the shirt looks as long as the message on the shirt is okay, and it's not like ripped in half or anything. I only care if it fits. I looked at it confused as to what I should be looking for, and I say, I don't see anything wrong with it. Karen, figuring out this was going nowhere, says, how did you put this shirt on the hanger? I show her. I put it in through the top because it was easier than to go through the bottom because they would get more wrinkled that way. And then she would yell at me for that. Karen condescendingly says, You were doing it wrong! Well, can I explain why I did it that way? Karen, getting louder and more demanding, says, Don't you dare argue with me! I'm not arguing, I just want to explain myself. 
Stop arguing back and listen to me, OP. Once again, do you want to know why I did it that way? This goes on for about 15 to 20 minutes, with her just yelling in my face about how I'm arguing back to her for showing me how to put my clothes up. Nothing but just non-stop shouting and her constantly cutting me off, saying I'm arguing and not being respectful. Finally, I just decide to be quiet and let her speak since this whole thing was going nowhere. She shows me the way that I am supposed to put up my clothes, and I'm trying my best not to cry. She finally finished, she said something else. I forgot what exactly, but it was something I had been trying to say before the whole debacle occurred. And I say, okay, can I just say this one thing? This is where Karen cranked the crazy level up to a 10 and says, that's it, we are going to talk to your father. She drags me downstairs to the exact other side of the house where my dad was doing work on the computer. I was bawling my eyes out. All that flooded my head was, I'm done for, I'm done for. We enter the office and I sit in a chair in the corner and I'm crying like crazy saying, I'm done for. I legit felt like my dad would believe her over me because she is the adult. She tells him her side and blatantly lies to him saying I was arguing back and wouldn't let her teach me. She said that no matter what, I wouldn't let her talk and was being disrespectful the whole time when really, it was the other way around. So my dad pulled me aside with her in the office there looking at me. Finally, I get a chance to speak my mind. I told him what happened and why I did what I did. I also told him that I was trying to explain myself, but she would not let me speak and made up the whole arguing back bullcrap. She said that it was a lie and I know it. Luckily, my dad believed me and I got away without repercussions. From what I could tell, nothing happened to her, but she and my dad had been fighting for a while, and eventually my dad divorced her, so I think that counts as a win. This is the first of the stories of my Karen. Posted by user Rambo Robertson's 20, titled... A short plane ride with an entitled mother and entitled kid. Little details, I'm a white male, 30, brown hair, brown eyes, short beard, and six foot tall. Story. I just sat down next to the window on a flight to New Mexico State that was about a two hour flight. I'm generally very laid back and have a go with the flow attitude. Recently, the limit on spaced seating has ended on coach flights, allowing everyone to sit next to each other when wearing masks on short flights. I have two empty seats next to me. Seats are assigned, but generally attendants can allow the switching of seats if warranted. Entitled mother walks down the aisle with entitled kid, stops at my aisle, and turns to look at me. I look over as she seems to be sizing me up. I kindly offer entitled kid the window seat, as what doesn't mean much to me could easily mean the world to him. I honestly am not sure if either of them heard me, as her entitled kid instantly out of nowhere started crying crocodile tears and created a tantrum about sitting in the window seat. I once again offered my seat and began to stand up. Entitled mother paying no attention to entitled kid, giving me the I'm the mother tone, and berating me for making her precious entitled kid cry. I'm a terrible man that needs to learn to respect women and children, blah blah blah. Attendant makes her way over to see what entitled mother's shouting and entitled kid's crying is about. Entitled mother begins again mentioning that I disrespected her son and herself, and that I should be removed from the plane. I've kept my mouth shut, as I'd very much like to make it to my destination. The attendant asks me if it's true what she claims. In short words, I reply a simple, no ma'am. The attendant then asks me if I'd like to switch seats. I agree, and as we start to walk away, Entitled Kid jumps to the window as if he wasn't crying a moment ago. Entitled Mother once again demands I be removed from the flight. The attendant looks back and replies, ma'am? If you raise your tone to me one more time, it will be you who is removed from the plane. That shut Entitled Mother down quick. The attendant asked me to follow as she led me to a seat in business class. I thanked her and asked her how many times she's found herself in this situation. 
She said, Honey, I've been doing this for 20 years. I run into this every other flight. It's best just to switch a seat and diffuse the situation, then let it play out. And then she walks off. I got to enjoy my first time in business class next to a window. For a bit of petty revenge at the end of the flight, generally coaches are last to exit. But I asked the same attendant if I could wait until the coach had passed before exiting the plane. The attendant knew exactly what I wanted and said to take as long as I needed. Entitled mother and entitled kids started by the aisle I sat in, and I mentioned with a smile that I hoped they had a pleasant flight. Entitled mother gives me the biggest frown I've seen and exits the plane. Attendant gives me a pack of nuts as I left the plane, and I have much more respect for the attendants deal with daily. I've read about these stories multiple times, and I have honestly doubted some of them. Never again. Posted by user Artilleryman08, titled, Karen thinks she can have free use of my truck. A few years ago, I had a side hustle on my days off. My job had a rotation schedule where I worked two weeks, then got two weeks off. I made plenty of money at my job, but it didn't hurt to make a little extra cash. I was in essence a tour guide, but for the region I lived in. I didn't have any planned tours, but usually just took people to see neat places that they would not know about or think to go. I was adamant about getting paid up front, and customers signed an agreement that made guarantees to protect my truck from messes or damage. Never had any issues, fortunately, and people always enjoyed the places I showed them. Except for one family. They seemed friendly enough when I was having them sign a contract and collecting my fee. I should mention my fee was $15 an hour, plus $75, plus $35 if it was a half day. This covered a tank of fuel, plus paid for my shuttling you around. I also kept a cooler with free water and some limited snacks. You were paying for my knowledge of the region, plus knowledge about the area's history and such. Plenty of times I had customers tell me, I've never seen so much cool stuff in one day. You could maybe find something cheaper, but I didn't care. Once money changed hands with this family, the attitude changed too. They began treating me like I was a second-class citizen, but I had their money so I didn't care. I drove them around to some of the most beautiful scenery that you can find. It's rare that people are left speechless by these places, and never have I seen someone not be impressed, until now. Every place I showed them, they just seemed disappointed. One of the places was a ski town popular with a lot of celebrities, not Aspen, and they were just like, eh, it's okay. I can't deny I was a little offended by their indifference, but whatever. They were never outright rude during the day, but were surprised when I didn't buy lunch for them. As I said, you are paying for my time and food is on you. But when I got back to town and dropped them off at their hotel, it got interesting. The wife says, you can just park in the back and leave the keys at the desk. Tell them they're for the Smith family. I say, I'm sorry, what? This truck? Just park it in the back. We might use it later. This is my truck. I'm not leaving it here. That's not part of the deal. Oh, please. There is no way you can own a vehicle like this. It obviously belongs to your company. I say, I do this job self-employed, on many days off from my job. I assure you this is my truck. I can show you my name on the title. Young man, I had just turned 30 by the way, if you don't do as you're told, I will be forced to call your boss. You mean me? I am my boss. Okay, smartass, get your boss on the phone right now. I thought about just driving off. It's 8pm, but then had a better idea. I called my supervisor at my real job. We'll call him Dan. Dan has been in the oil field for 14 years and could be quite the cusser. Good supervisor. He knew what I did on my days off and even sent people my way a few times. He answered and I just said, one of my clients is demanding to speak with my boss, so here she is, and handed her my phone. Wife, sounding smug, said, I tried to tell your driver to leave the truck here so we could use it, but he lied and said he owns it. I could hear him yelling, 
Are you effing stupid? I didn't discern anything else, but I know he gave her a good thrashing. She just walked to the window, handed me my phone and said, he wants to talk to you, and then walked away. He says, that fix your problem? I say, yeah, thanks, Dan. Anytime, brother. Posted by user DeFoxtrot86, titled, Babysitter was convinced there was something wrong with me and took me to a hospital without notifying my mother. This happened when I was about four years old or so, and sadly, I don't remember it personally, but my mom told the story many times in rants when I was a kid. Here is what I remember. For context, I have high-functioning autism, so as a child I was, how we say, quirky. At the time, my mom was not only working a minimum wage job, but was also putting herself through college, so she frequently needed a babysitter for me and my older sister. One day, she had to hire a new one, and I was left with, let's call her Brittany. Leave Brittany alone. Brittany was a young and attractive girl, around 18 to 20, I think, and she seemed very nice to my mom. But after her babysitting me for just a few hours, she was convinced there was something seriously wrong with me. So she put me in her car and took me to the hospital without notifying anyone. My sister was at school, so we were the only ones in the house. While at the hospital, I don't know if Brittany pretended to be my mother or a concerned relative or something, but she managed to convince the doctors and nurses that she was right in thinking I was in serious need of some sort of immediate mental help. Finally, my mum was notified while she was at work. This was about 1990, before most people had cell phones. She got a call on the company's landline because one smart doctor there realised Brittany was not related to me, or even knew much about me for that matter, and they made her reluctantly cough up my mum's contact info. To say my mum was furious was an understatement. The ground shook as she stormed into the hospital and demanded to know where I was. When she got to the room that they were keeping me in, I had wires and electrodes hooked all over my head. She said I looked like something out of a horror movie. She immediately told them to seize what they were doing. Then she fired Brittany on the spot despite her crazy protests in calling my mother a bad mum. The doctors determined that Brittany was full of hot air as well after examining me, and she was left on the hook for the bill of the hospital's time. After that, my mum started having my great-grandparents babysit me instead, and we moved in with them not too long after. Edit, I honestly didn't expect this story to have blown up the way it has. I know this story sounds fake to many, and that my referring to the babysitter as Brittany wasn't a good idea. And this might not have been the right sub to post the story, but I had no idea where else to post it. But this did happen, and honestly, I wish it didn't because it actually traumatised my mother a bit. She couldn't get the image of what happened out of her head for years. I had to comfort her many times as a child when the story was brought up. She blamed herself for leaving me with that person. And while this was before cell phones were common, my mum was easily reached via landline at her work. Brittany did have access to a phone in the house that we lived in at the time, and my mum was easily reached at work. The doctors had no problem getting a hold of her once they actually had her name and number. The doctors also had to apologise profusely to my mother for believing Brittany, because they had doubts after initially checking me out. But she lied to them, and was adamant that something was seriously wrong with me. I was fully capable of speech at the time, and diagnoses for autism in 1990 weren't so readily handed out as they were just a few years later. I wasn't diagnosed with Asperger's till I was 12 or 13, and before that, Doctors just gave me a small examination and decided to pump me full of Ritalin from the time I was 6 or 7 till I was 15. I didn't get any real mental improvement till I was fully off the medication, as it left me depressed and unable to focus on more than one thing at a time. Also, yes, it does seem over the top that Brittany was stuck with the bill, but I think for her, that was better than being arrested. Plus, people in those situations can often be billed for wasting the time of the police or doctors. So I'll end with this. Believe what you want, but this did happen.
Posted by user Fred Z Red. Titles: Karen tried to exploit the death of my father. This story is a long one, so buckle in. You're in for a wild ride. This happened in 2009, but I need to give some backstory for context. At the end of 2007, when I was 17, I suffered a spinal cord injury and brain injury from my own mistake. I spent most of 2008 in hospital for rehabilitation, and my dad, my hero, was with me the whole time. He chose my life over the opposite wishes of my mother when I was in a coma. He fed me when I couldn't do it on my own. He cried with me when I couldn't understand why my legs wouldn't work anymore. He helped me through all the trials and tribulations of rehabilitation. He was there through thick and thin, and I owe him so much, even now, 11 years after his death. I wouldn't be who I am today if it wasn't for his love and support throughout my life. My mother is a neglectful, narcissistic, and abusive person. My dad put his life on hold for me when I had my accidents, which included his passion of flying. He was a skilled and experienced pilot, flying small planes and gliders for many years before purchasing his own ultralight plane in 2007, similar to a glider but without a roof. Around the middle of 2007, he began to build his own house in a large property just out of town. He worked in construction and knew how to build houses, and had friends and family help him finish building the house while I was in hospital in 2008. At the end of 2008, the house was finished and I moved there to live with my dad. I'd been living on my own and working full-time at a local supermarket before my accident, so going from 100% independence to needing full-time care was a hard adjustment for me to make, but dad was with me and helped me through it. I'm not sure I would have gotten through it without him. In retrospect, I never knew what I had until it was taken away. Like Dad's laugh or his uncanny ability of lighting up a room by just being there. 2009 was one of the hardest years of my life, having to adjust to a life I had never known before. A life in a wheelchair. My dad still had to work, so he would hire a live-in support worker to stay with me while he went away for work. Because he worked in construction, most of his work was around the state, which meant he had to travel for work. There were three different support workers that were hired, but the one relevant to this story was Julie, who was recommended to us by someone in the family. Julie was the support worker that stayed for longer, but was the one that I didn't get along with. Our personalities didn't mesh well together, but I just went along with it, knowing that Dad had to work. In the middle of 2009, Julie suggested that I submit my story in a magazine, a well-known lifestyle magazine in Australia that pays for real-life stories. I wanted to help my dad with money, so I submitted my story, and not long after submitting, it got selected. I went through the process of telling my story, which took me a few weeks to write, as I didn't have the finger dexterity and brain processing abilities that I have now. I submitted the finished story to the magazine and waited for their response. They had to edit it to fit their storytelling format. It was to be put in the Christmas edition at the end of that year. All I had to do was wait. At the start of December 2009, my sister was home for school holidays, 16 years old at the time, and Julie had gone home for her Christmas break. My dad and his brother, who lived a few hours away, had a work opportunity in the next state that would last two weeks. They both worked in construction, I wasn't able to be left on my own at the time, so my dad trusted my sister to keep an eye on me while they were gone. My dad took his ultra-lightweight plane with him so he could fly it in his days off, and also take his brother flying, as he'd never been in a plane before. There was a domestic airport in the city that we were traveling to for work. When they left for work, I never got that cliche moment like in the movies with the feeling that something was going to go wrong. They just left and all was well, with dad calling us every night before bed to wish us a good night. On the 6th of December, he called us at around 7pm to wish us a good night. He said that they were going to take his brother flying that night. Nothing out of the ordinary, we just said good night and said we'd talk to him tomorrow. In retrospect, I wish I'd begged him not to go flying. But dwelling on what could have been isn't going to change a thing, which is something that has taken me many years to grasp. 
I spent too many years thinking of the what ifs. Then tomorrow came. At 9am, my uncle, who lived about 45 minutes away, stopped by. This was out of the ordinary, as he rarely stopped by out of the blue like that. And then he said the words that still resonate in my mind. Your dad and your uncle are dead. I wanted it to be a sick joke. This stuff only happens in movies and bad dreams. Not in real life. Not to us. Not to me. They had been flying the plane and it crashed. Killing them instantly as the plane hit the ground. Not out of pilot error, simply just bad luck. But it was true. As the realization sunk in, my pain flooded to the surface. Memories of him came with tears. Him tucking me in at night when I was a kid, comforting me when I had a bad dream. Telling me it will be okay when I thought my life was over after my accident. But at that moment, I didn't think that anything would be alright again. In the week leading to the funeral, word spread about what happened, and we received many well wishes as people began to make plans to attend the funeral. A few days after their death, I received a call from the magazine. They had heard about what happened, not from the newspapers, as I'd never give them my dad's name, but from Julie. I was furious. I called her immediately to ask why she had called and told them when it was not her place to do so. She told me that she wanted to be paid for her part of the story when it wasn't her story to tell. The most interaction they'd had was the occasional conversation regarding work and the weekly paycheck that he sent to her, so they were in no way close friends. I had still intended for my story to be told, but I didn't want it to be twisted into their own narrative with the knowledge of his passing. He was my hero, and I wanted him to be perceived as such, and not to have my story be twisted into a sob story about my dead dad. And I wasn't going to profit off of his death. He deserves so much more than that. So I told the magazine that Julie was to have no part in the story, and that it was to be written exactly as I'd originally planned. As much as they wanted to use his death to tell the story, they respected my wishes and told it as it was. Still, to this day, I carry rage for what Julie tried to do. Nobody's misfortune and pain should be exploited like she tried to do. The title of the article was All for Dad. I am in a much better place now that I have washed away the guilt and the what-ifs. There is a hole in my life in which he should fill, but my pain is numbed by the fact that they didn't suffer. I miss my dad and I think about him every day, but I'm thankful for the time that we had together. Rest in peace, old fella. Posted by user Ms. Finch 87 titled Entitled Wedding Guest. So I was so frustrated by my sister-in-law's behavior regarding my wedding that I ended up reading a whole collection of posts on Entitled Wedding Guests and realized that she fit right in with those. My partner and I decided to ask his niece to be a junior bridesmaid so as to avoid problems with family politics. The first sign of drama was when her mother, my sister-in-law, suggested that I make her my junior maid of honor, because she had a special relationship with me. More so, apparently, than other junior bridesmaids. This was news to me, and what the F even is that? Then I was asked to give her a job to do, so she felt important. I wasn't keen on this because of the added complexity, but nevertheless figured something out to avoid problems. A couple of months down the track when nothing had been done, I queried it and was told that she was completely overwhelmed and suffering extreme anxiety and the burden I had placed on her was unfair. The job? Choosing from a selection of three different earrings for the junior bridesmaids, which I had confirmed with her mother, was appropriate before asking. Oh my god. I apologized with a lot of eye rolling and withdrew the job. I was then accused of not making her feel important enough. I was then asked by my sister-in-law if I could arrange to have robes for my bridesmaids because her daughter wanted them, and it was specified to me what slogan should be on them. I was livid and refused, but then was told that sister-in-law would buy one for only her daughter if I wouldn't do it. So I went out and organized the robes so that I wasn't faced with a situation of two other little girls sobbing because they missed out, and that brat prancing around rubbing their noses in it. 
and also so I didn't end up with a tacky slogan designed by an 11-year-old. Then we got to the food. His niece wanted McDonald's at the reception. I explained that this would not be possible, that the restaurant would not allow external food to be brought in. And frankly, neither would I, because unless a guest has a medical issue, it's just downright rude. I was told that she had to be allowed to get McDonald's because that's all she'll eat and she couldn't go hungry. Oh, boo-hoo. I told her it simply wasn't possible. Sister-in-law then threatened not to attend the wedding if we couldn't accommodate her daughter. I removed them from the bridal party and told them where to go. The response? So, what are you going to do about the food? <laughs> Updates. The wedding hasn't happened yet, so I foresee more dramas before it does, and I will update as it does. She has been told that there is no room to move on the food, and to deal with it herself. She's also been told not to sabotage it for the other junior bridesmaids, which is something I'm worried about now that she will see that her daughter is actually excluded from the whole thing. I also think that the crap will hit the fan when it becomes clear that they are still getting all the party favours. I doubt they will come, and I don't think she had any intention of attending unless her daughter could be the centre of attention. It really is like her daughter is the bride with all the demands. I would uninvite her myself, and have been harsher earlier, but she's my partner's only living close adult relative. He has his kids, but they're children so it's different, and it's important to him that she attend. He has been through a lot in the last couple of years, and it's important to me that I look after him and that he's happy, so I'm happy to take on the burden of dealing with issues and to make sacrifices, to a point. The junior maid of honor situation was particularly appalling, because if anyone would be promoted to that, it would be his daughter, not his niece. But still, WTF, I've never even heard of such a thing. Sister-in-law is extremely entitled and thinks the whole world revolves around her, and I think she's teaching her daughter the same thing. There was another incident with the dresses that I had completely forgotten about. I did not want traditional bridesmaids, so I had told everyone that they could choose a dress that they really wanted, pursuant to coordinating it with me so it was appropriate, and they all worked together. I was also happy to pay for the outfits because I really don't like the expectation that people participate in a wedding pursuant to my requirements and have to spend their own money to do so, especially when it's an expensive wedding. I said three things, no navy, no one shoulder, no splits. Sister-in-law, also a bridesmaid, without checking with me, went and bought herself a one shoulder navy dress with a side split. It clashed with my sister's dress the actual maid of honor, and the junior bridesmaid dresses. My mother, sister, and I spent hours and hours reorganizing the other dresses to make it work. Not just to match her, but because she looked like the damn maid of honor instead of my sister. We also ticked thousands of dollars up against a wall doing this. I was petrified that if I told her not to wear that dress, she would do it just to spite me, and we decided to keep my sister's new dress private so she couldn't get something else to upstage her again. I am lucky because we're in a financial position to do this. We're not zillionaires, but we both have well-paying jobs and investments. But I certainly resented it, and that's not something that is usually possible for people. I'm tempted now to send her a bill. Alright, that's where I think I'm going to end today's episode, guys. As always, I really do hope you learned something or just really enjoyed the posts that were put up today. Quick shout out to all my new and existing Patreon and channel members. You should be able to see your name on screen right now. And if you don't, then I don't think you're part of the club. And you really should join the club because it's a great club. And I want to thank every single one of you guys for supporting me in this journey. It really means so much to me and I love you all so much for it. Thank you for helping me out. As you can tell, I'm now happy and healthy back in Australia. Thank God it's not cold like Ireland. <laughs> I don't like wearing jumpers everywhere. I prefer the heat. Thank you very much. I know that's an unpopular opinion. Anyway, guys, I really do hope you enjoyed today's episode. I'll see you in the next one. Have a good day, night, sleep, whatever you're up to, and I'll see you later. Bye.